Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 685. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 10th, 2021. All right, thank you for joining us for another program. I would say you're going to be with us for the next 10 minutes or 20 or 30, but you know we always go about 40 minutes. We have lots of interesting topics to talk about, even in the dead of summer. It's not summer, it's September now, when everybody says, oh, fall's coming. And I can tell you, here in Wisconsin, in Madison, south Wisconsin, I'm watching some of the trees turn colors, George. Right here at the campground, there's one behind the uh, camper here. It's got half ye- yellow, half green winter is coming it's not too far off <laughs> yes kevin kevin we only have two more months of hurricane season so <laughs> i know <laughs> Oof. we're gonna dodge that bullet down there in webster and uh, lucanto um so before we get too uh, far into the show please like it share it comment we got lots of wonderful comments on the last couple episodes subscribe if you're not subscribed and if you really don't want to watch us on screen we have a podcast you can find the link to the podcast in the show notes on youtube uh george how you been doing exciting times getting ready for the fall season school has started so the kids are back in sunday school and uh we're just finishing up our summer bible studies and summer programs and for me, this is an exciting time of year because I, I was one of these kids who always liked the start of the school year because of seeing friends and getting back to fun activities. And I sort of look at the church life the same way. Our church year's starting, mm-hmm. and I just, I'm just i just excited about what the Lord may be have in store for us in the coming months. Well, you told me in the pre-show you're making a model church, and I'm like, well, some type of uh, uh, teaching for other people how to use their churches and make a model of the best type of priest, deacon, stuff like that. No, it's it's, it's actually a wood model. I don't have grandchildren yet. I have two unmarried daughters in their mid-20s, so perhaps uh, this is my compensation, but I'm making a uh, scale model of a old New England-style church because nobody wants a picture of an ugly Florida church. <laughs> <Nothing> to... <laughs> where you take off the roof and inside you have the pews and the altar. And I and basically it's a cheating tool to show the children the different parts, the narthex, the sanctuary, the altar, this and that. And I love doing these sorts of things. I enjoy children's ministry. And this is giving me an opportunity to, instead of building dollhouses for little girls, I get to build churches for little girls and boys. Oh, that's cute. Uh, when you get a chance, send us some pictures, and maybe it'll inspire some of our other uh, viewers to see what's going and, on. Yeah. And see, this is the only, I mean, this is the time, hurricane season is the only time of year that Susan allows me to use power tools outdoors, you know, like nailers for shutters. Sure. And the only time I can use power tools indoors and exacto knives is when I'm making something for the church, because otherwise she says, George, you're going to cut your fingers off. Yes, I George, know. You- uh, yes, yes. I, I'm with Susan. You are always one power or two away from a, a quick trip to the uh, urgent care. So, uh, well, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't see why she gets so upset when I'm underneath the car with the acetylene torch. Uh, you know, I really want to teach myself welding. And, you, uh, you, you got a toe infection stepping on a washer. I don't think you can really say, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to good news stories. Um, we have a couple this week, and we actually got one from a viewer that we want to include. You probably won't make our, our typical uh, good news stories, but we want to encourage those uh, of you out there who have a good news story in this time of trial and tribulation within the church. Uh, forward it to us in email. You can do that by sending it to anglicantv at gmail.com. My first uh good news story is the texas abortion law okay texas has decided to have what we would for all intents and purposes call a heartbeat law if you could detect the heartbeat you're not allowed to uh kill the unborn child cool I, if you guys remember ohio had passed it but the uh, uh the governor there the governor of ohio didn't sign it uh governor abbott of texas said yes i'll sign this this is supreme court uh stayed the decision and said yeah that's fine we don't see anything here that we need to intervene in and the whole world except for the populace 
I mean, the political world and the um, press world are going wild over this, George. But as far as I can see, your average person is, well, let's see what happens. So well, it's, fa it's fascinating because the Texas law is, Kevin, you mentioned it's very close to an Ohio law hmm. that uh, was vetoed by the governor. Was it vetoed or did he just refuse to I, sign it? One or the other. I, I don't want to surmise on that. Well, this, this uh, fetal heartbeat law is entirely within American historical religious tradition. Up and the abortion uh, really didn't become criminalized until the 1870s, 1880s in the late Victorian era. Before that time, abortions were permissible until the quickening of the child. So what that meant was in America in the colonial period, uh, when you could feel the child start to move, at that point, you could not have an abortion. It was then a soul, it would die, it would be murder, this and that. Now, the Catholic Church has always been consistent in their teachings, but America for its first few hundred years was a Protestant nation. And this fetal heartbeat law is essentially a modern updating of the quickening rule that uh, the our forefathers uh, adopted uh, 200 years ago. So it, it's fascinating uh, things that come around go around, if you will. They do, but especially. I mean that that the, there was there was so in other words the the the, the Puritans and the, the Separatists and the early the early Episcopalians and Baptists didn't have this conception life begins at conception because they didn't understand embryology but they knew that once a quickening which would we would say is the detection of a heartbeat where there is life can be detected boom you stop right there mm -hmm. so I, I just find this fascinating and uh, neat uh, on well, so many levels yeah you know i mean from a historical perspective it's fascinating from a scientific a scientific a scientific uh um lens it's very interesting too because you know if you talk to a scientist he will agree or she will agree that life really does begin at conception there's a whole process within the first 15 20 minutes that is measurable by scientific instrumentation and they would say you know we we can't say it doesn't start here and we can't determine any other point other than conception where it would start so we would default to say yes it starts here um and so i i would go as a christian and as a, a lover of science with that definition of when life starts um and you, you can't really be mistaken if you start there you're you're not in any gray area one of the things I find fascinating, though, on this whole Texas, I am, I think this is a wonderful law. Mm -hmm. So that's the premise from which I begin, is what I call the dog that did the dog in the night. Yeah, the, the Sherlock dog. Holmes yeah. episodes, yeah. the Silver Blaze. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Holmes, what about the dog in the night? It didn't bark. That's the curious incident. The leading Catholic prelate in Texas is Archbishop Donardo of San Antonio. Israeli said nothing about this. His major pronounce, pronouncement in the last few weeks has been saying no, no traditional Latin masses. No Latin mass here. for you. He's, he's like the soup Nazi. No Latin mass for you. No, no. So <laughs> he's not really taken, you know, this is his state. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas is a very large Catholic population, and he's essentially out of the loop on this one. And then you've got Archbishop Cardalone in San Francisco where the church is much weaker, much smaller, that he's lambasting and tearing Nancy Pelosi's head off by saying she can't call herself a Catholic and support abortion. So you've got the Catholic hierarchy not really speaking of one mind. Archbishop Gregory in Washington says Joe Biden can receive Holy Communion and deny Catholic teaching on abortion. No problem there. He can't get it in San Francisco. Uh, and it's just fascinating. The church... Catholic Church, also the Anglican Church. I, and I haven't seen uh, anything from Michael Curry, which I'm surprised. Yeah, normally. Usually well, Michael, well, Michael hold Curry. On. But this, he could have put something out. He could have said something, but it just missed us because nobody cares what the Episcopal Church thinks anymore. Well, I do. And I, and I read <laughs> everything do. that he says. <laughs> okay. And he hasn't said anything. And perhaps I've missed it, but I haven't seen anything out of Foley Beach. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying 
the churches are well known for their stands on these issues to begin with. I'm not saying that they're silent on the issue of abortion. What I am saying is that I'm surprised not to have heard some sort of pastoral word of encouragement to people on both sides of the of this story uh, who are affected by this in Texas and other parts of the U.S. I think it's... Uh... I would Could say just people, be summer vacation. It's I summer think. vacation, people getting back from sabbaticals and uh, the two-week vacation, or it's a wait and see. I want to see what happens here before we, we put the official word of the church on this um, because we don't want the any blowback to fall onto the Roman Catholic Church or the Methodist Church or the Episcopal or ACNA, uh, ACNN churches. So uh, it could be a, just a wait and see. Uh, and that's exactly what the Supreme Court said. We're going to wait and see. We'll see what happens here. So interesting times. We have another good news story uh, sent to us, George. What is that? One of our viewers from Spain, an Anglican clergyman, tells us that the Spanish Reformed Episcopal Church, which is the Anglican Church in Spain for Spaniards, mm -hmm. their chaplaincies of the Church of England in Spain as well. But the they're starting a pilgrimage center in Santiago de Compostela, northwestern part in Galicia, in Spain. And Archbishop Carlos Lopez Lozano, I'm being all Castilian here when I <laughs> slur Spain. my Z's and S's, they're raising money to have an Anglican pilgrim's house at the end of the Camino de Santiago, the pilgrim's trail to Santiago de Compostela. Or, or the, to celebrate uh, the St. James pilgrimages. And I think this is, this is a really good move because you have Anglicans, Anglo-Catholics in England love to go on the Santiago Trail mm -hmm. and to have their final destination an Anglican shrine as opposed to the Catholic shrine, uh, I think is a smart move. Now, the Spanish Reformed Episcopal Church for native Spaniards has been under the Franco era, it was under heavy penal sanctions. The Catholic Church really was favored and Protestants were not uh, recognized in law and what privileges they did have were very limited. And so the fall of Franco was actually a boom for uh, the Protestant movement in Spain. And now you're seeing it sort of mature uh, into building its own institutions, into its own things that are fully Spanish, uh, not just imports from the rest of the communion. So and, good for Car Bishop Carlos and good for the Spanish church. And, and good for Trinity Wall Street. Um, the Episcopal Church has, over the last 20 years, spent close to $200 million as a whole, diocese and uh, 815 and Trinity Wall Street, uh, fighting the Episcopal Wars. Um, it is nice to see money well spent uh, in something like this. And I just want to take a moment of opportunity to give compliment. You know, we, we appreciate something, money being spread in this way. So They're, they're not paying all of it, but they're, start, they're giving the seed money yeah. to get it started. So, so uh, I'll, I think I'll put up uh, the, a little item, a feature item on this. So if people want to read more or perhaps even donate, uh, they, they'll be able to see what it's all about. Cool. All right. On Anglican Inc. We always follow good news with uh, Church of England. Well, we're going to follow with a, a, <laughs> a nice British story, a UK story. Uh, Bishop Andrew. We, we yeah. Oh, actually, Kevin, we can yes. stay on key by talking about Justin Welby not eating meat. And you want to do the climate change first, okay? Let's do climate change. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> if you were paying attention to the Anglican.inc. This week, we put up a story on it. At the end of last week's episode, I mentioned that I just got an email from uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and Pope Francis, and the Orthodox priest guy. Oh, I'm so much trouble. Bartholomew in, Bartholomew in Istanbul. That's the guy, okay, saying that, you know, we need to continue this war on climate change. It's our Christian responsibility. And um, I said... We just talked in this whole episode about how the church is falling apart because of COVID. And the, the, the Christian leaders of this world put out a statement on climate change. The, the least important thing right now, it, it, during and post-COVID, 
is climate change. The most important things are church structure and responding to the people who are going to be homeless now that uh, there's no more rent protection. There's You can be evicted by your landlords. Uh, they're going to start cutting off uh, federal funds for the people who are unemployed. There, there's a whole lot more to worry about than bottom of the list, lift up the, oh, climate change. But they did it. And thankfully, Justin Welby, who's coming off sabbatical soon, said, why don't I go to the BBC radio and do an interview? And George, to my heart's content, he is the king of virtual signaling. He's the Gandhi of 2021. What did he Justin tell us? Justin Welby, not me. <laughs> no, no, not you. I'm, I'm, not me. Just you don't have the neck for Gandhi. <laughs> oh. What did he say to the BBC, George? I sometimes wonder why Justin Welby picked certain things to leave his sabbatical to do, and he doesn't pick other things. Well, he signed this joint statement on the environment with the Pope and the ecumenical patriarch. And I have to tell you, friends, I look at the readership, uh, little clicks and views on Anglican Inc., and the story about a new slate roof for St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin has more readers than the environment statement from the Pope, Francis, and Bartholomew. So that tells you what the market says about this story. Well, perhaps he wanted to give it a little more jazz, and so he appears on the BBC, Justin Welby, and he does all of this, I'm trying to lead a life where I myself, by as an individual, help the climate. I'm not going to eat as much meat anymore because, oh. you know, meat is from cows which is from deforestation and cows give off methane gas when they burp and fart and it causes uh what does it cause when cows burp and fart um, <laughs> methane. <laughs> methane well not when they and burp when, when they fart it causes methane and well here george i'm gonna do a, a simple science project with you justin welby here's your choice you can spend a night in a garage with a cow or a running car you, which which do you want to choose right now? Okay, w which do you think will kill you overnight? The cow? Not really. No. So yeah, well, that's. So I, Justin, we, we've Justin Welby has told us he's really taking the environmental challenges seriously. Yeah. So he's cutting back on his meat consumption. And he also talked about that you know there's also a housing crisis in England. Young people can't afford housing, and we shouldn't be cutting up our beautiful countryside to build more housing for young people. So the answer is, is us older people to take up less housing stock, uh, moving out of our houses and giving them to young people. And he went on to say, I myself don't even own a home in England. I And he lives in two oh, yeah. Episcopal palaces, uh, Lambeth Palace and Canterbury, yeah. and also uh, down in Canterbury. Mm -hmm. uh, but you notice, Kevin, he did mention that he doesn't own a house in England. Southern France. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Justin Welby owns a house in the French countryside. <laughs> so this virtue signaling is just how pathetic. It, well, it's pathetic and it's breathtaking. And um, this is the type of stuff viewers and listeners of the BBC, of the New York Times, of the Los Angeles you know that they, they eat this stuff up so he's feeding the people what they want to hear i am gone but they don't want to hear it because they're not reading it they're not watching it you know, informed I mean, I... christians the the variety who watch the show the variety who uh, read anglican inc the variety of people we hang out with in our circles care not what justin welby or Rowan or uh the other uh, current leadership of the uh, Anglican Communion are talking about. They care about serving their flocks. They care about growing closer to God. They care about what are we going to do in COVID times. We, we've proven that over and over again. I don't mind that Justin Welby is over on a completely different topic, not being listened to. Thank God. Yeah. But you're right. They don't... Well, it, they, it's just such wasted opportunity. Mm -hmm. The Church of England had an opportunity in the COVID crisis to be a moral voice, and instead it turned into a government cheerleader, an adjunct mm -hmm. to the, the adjunct to the NHS, 
um, with all of that implies of sclerotic bureaucracy. Uh, and it's just such a shame that the Archbishop of Canterbury and the smart people, because there are smart people in the Church of England, uh, certainly they manage their money well, why are they not able to sort of break this freefall of uh, irrelevancy, of silliness? Um, there's, there's a story that one of our viewers sent us that uh, uh, he was quite agitated about. Uh, Bury St. Edmund, uh, which is a cathedral in uh, the uh, Suffolk area, north, southeast, just sort of northeast of London, took out its pews from the church last week, the cathedral, Bury St. Edmund Cathedral, and held a craft beer festival. So you would walk into the church and there were stacks of kegs of beer from local breweries, craft breweries. And during that week, they held their weekday services in their Christian education building next door. And the uh, fellow who uh, sent us this was saying, isn't this appalling that they would have alcohol uh, flowing inside a cathedral? And I don't know if I got as excited. Now, Gavin and I have had these arguments in the past about whether it's in good taste or whether it's heresy. I don't think it's heresy, but I sometimes think these guys, you know, they're trying, and I give them credit for trying to use a building uh, that is the center of a town to sort of make it the center of activity. But the problem I see is that, okay, we'll have the beer festival, but they don't do anything with that to attract and encourage and enliven and bring people to closer to Christ. They're starting to think about these things, but they don't know how to make it work, make it click. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have trouble with beer being served in the parish hall of a church. I, the sanctuary, you're starting to rile the liturgical Kevin a little bit, um, but it is, it, it, it's a building uh, on as such. It, if you go to Ray Sutton's church, uh, uh, Church of the Holy Communion in uh, outside of Dallas, Texas, in their parish hall, they actually have a kegerator. You put the, the keg of beer in there, and they, they serve that for the dances and stuff like that uh, for weddings. No big deal. That doesn't bother me. In fact, I'm, I think that's kind of cool. But uh, once you start playing with the sanctuary, I, I could get a little riled up with the sanctuary. But that's just, well, yeah. you know... Yeah, like a few years ago, Elton John, the uh, Elton John rented out St. John the Divine in New York City, and they had a concert. And Elton John danced on top of the altar. Uh, that's a little far. That's too much. <laughs> too much. So <laughs> that's too much. That's that's and but see the thing is, I don't consider that heresy. I just consider that abysmal taste. Uh, but hey, those people in New York—they're going broke. They need the money. Elton John has it. They'll take yeah. it from him. Yeah. But. This, in other words, what I'm saying is that there are people who are starting to think outside the box. How can mm -hmm. we sort of make the cathedral a center of life in the town once again? Okay, let's have a festival where we get people through, but where are the where are your volunteers to sort of tackle people? Let me tell you about Jesus Christ, or mm -hmm. here are these courses, or here are these things that we can help you with, or here's how our children's programs, here's how we can... In other words, there's got to be more to it than just the, the initial good idea. There has to be action. There has to be conversation. We're seeing it, we're seeing it in the lower levels, mm -hmm. mid, mid, mid to lower ranks, mm -hmm. but we're not seeing it from Justin Welby and the bishops of the church. No. Uh, I find the greatest success in ministering to other people in conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, when we are one-to-one -one, uh, in, in talking about godly things. That's a wonderful way to encourage the body to minister uh, and to to seek and find the lost, it just it, it's a model that works, and we got that model all the way back to the New Testament with our disciples and uh, our Lord Himself. We should move on to our next story, George, because we spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, oh, we I can't, can't, we moved climate change up, so that's technically the third floor story. Let's move on to the fourth story. Bishop Ann Dyer is still in the news. Uh, they're going to commission another report because the first report was too mean or too bullying of the bully or something like that. What's the latest news there, George? 
Well, the Scottish Episcopal Church College of Bishops on September 8th re released its first public statement about the Anne Dyer affair. Anne Dyer is the Bishop of Aberdeen and Orkney, in the northeast of, of Scotland. Mm -hmm. She was appointed in 2017 after the diocese was unable to elect a bishop. Her appointment was controversial because she was a liberal woman appointed to the most conservative diocese in Scotland that really wasn't on board with women clergy, let alone any of the other things. And since she's been there, it's been pretty much a fiasco. It was not a fit. She doesn't drive, and it's a rural diocese, uh, one of the little minor things, but just so on and so forth. There have been problems since she's been there. She has very autocratic management style, and complaints were made, and she finally allowed an investigation, which she had to sign off on, to be made. And it was sent to the bishops, and the bishops commissioned a man named Professor Torrance, the uh, former moderator of the Church of Scotland, to investigate. He came out with his report, which was to be public. When the report came out, the Scottish bishops sat on it. And after they sat on it, somebody leaked the report to the Times of London. And, we, and the we, Times and have been clever. Since they then. have. Well, the, I, I want to go back up. You keep saying the report. I would say the damning report. I, I would put a, another adjective under there. The report concluded, and each, each day the Times releases another tidbit. So uh, it's exciting to watch it all unfold. The report found the bishop was grossly incompetent in her management of the diocese, that she was a bully, that she had created a dysfunctional sclerotic system. Uh, today, the Times reported that one of her complaints was that after she fired the cathedral organist, uh, she was so frightened of the man because of his violent threats against her that he, she had to lock herself in the vestry of the cathedral to protect herself from his violence. Well. The uh, co report commissioned and performed by outsiders said this never happened. So not only is she grossly incompetent, not only is she a bully, she's a fantasist. The, yesterday, the Times reported that an internal human resources report was made and given to the bishops. And Bishop Dyer then contacted the author of the report and asked her to change it to make it less damning. And the woman said, no, this is what I found. So on September 8th, the Scottish Episcopal Church released a, a statement saying, well, we're so upset that the Torrance report's been leaked to the Times, and we really didn't feel the Torrance report covered all aspects of this issue, so we're going to do another report, another commission, and yes, we will release shortly, Charlie. Which, which the Times interprets as next week, but in English parlance can be before the next Queen yeah. Before the next king is coronated, <laughs> before the next coronation, there will be a, the report will be released. And if what the Times said is true, this is a damning indictment of the Scottish bishops and Bishop Dyer for gross incompetence and uh, unfitness for Episcopal office. Well, you, you mentioned something important there. This isn't just Bishop Dyer. She was appointed. She she has a College of Bishops who knows through this report and other incidents, uh, the damage she's doing to her diocese. And the fact that they've ignored it, they're pushing the paper on, um, is an indictment of them as well. It's not just her. So wanted to be sure we, we took that. George, the church continues to grow. The Anglican communion is growing uh, in leaps and bounds. In other places, not so much here right now. It's certainly not in the northeast of America. But we have a new... Uh, primate was elected, and I thought you could talk about that real quick. Carlos Mazzini, mm -hmm. the Bishop of La Bombo, which is based in the city of Maputo, used to be called Lorenzo Marquez, in southeast the capital of Mozambique. Mm -hmm. He has been elected the presiding bishop of the province of Angola and Mozambique at their inaugural synod where they adopted the constitution and rules of order. The dean of the province was Andres Sores, Bishop of Luanda in Angola, and the presiding bishop is Bishop Matsine of Lorenz of Maputo. So this is the newest province, uh, the first uh, uh, first Lusophone or Portuguese speaking province in Africa, after the two Brazilian churches, the third uh, sp uh, Portuguese speaking province in the Anglican world. Mm. All right, this is also by the time 40% uh, of this audience watches this, it's 9-11. And uh, uh, not a, a 
wonderful day to remember. I do remember remember it like it was yesterday, like so many of you. Uh, it's hard to believe 20 years have gone on. I used to live in Connecticut at the time, uh, about 60 minutes, 65 minutes by car north of World Trade Center. And uh, the day is like yesterday because I was a young, uh, how young was I? 20 years ago, I was 35 years old, George. You were 25, right? You were just... <laughs> I was 15. 15. So I was 35 or 36. And uh, um, it's just at that time in your age, something like that happening to a, a, your country in an unprovoked attack, it just changes your worldview. And so when the president at the time, George W. Bush, says we're going to fight terrorism, we're going to fight uh, radical Islam, we're going to go to the source of where this is happening, he wanted to go into Afghanistan, young Kevin believed that that was the right thing to do. Uh, 20 years later, through many trials, tribulations, wars, conflict, uh, more bombings, more terrorism, we have taken ourselves out of Afghanistan, we're licking our wounds, and the world is not any safer, in my opinion. Uh, you may have a different opinion, George, but what, what are your kind of your memories of all this time? Well, I remember our children were in uh, kindergarten, mm -hmm. and the kindergarten called and asked that we pick them up and take mm -hmm. them home. And I came home from the parish. Um, I actually received a phone call from the Church of England newspaper in London telling me that this had happened. I was I was their chief correspondent at that time, and they said Rowan Williams is at Trinity Wall Street giving a speech right now. Call Trinity Wall Street, find out what's happening. Call Trinity Wall Street. Of course, the phones are down, mm -hmm. so I called up to eight. I called the Episcopal News Service, and I spoke uh, with uh, I believe it was Jen Nunley, might have been somebody else, Matt Davies, but they basically described to me what they could see out of their windows at eight fifteen Second Avenue. Um, I can remember the horror of what is next, because as that day unfolded, you know, we had the two planes at the Pentagon, uh, two planes in New York, the plane at the Pentagon, mm -hmm. the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania, what next was going to happen. Sure. It was a very frightening day. Well, um, what was unique about 9-11 was it was broadcast around the world. The world was seeing in real time what was happening. Um, mm -hmm. If you had the TV on, uh, most channels had switched to the live coverage of C CBS, Fox News, which was new at the time, ABC, NBC, were all had their cameras just trained in different uh, areas on the World Trade Center. As you're watching, oh my gosh, you see the fire trucks coming in, and oh, I hope they put that out. Oh, I see the firemen going up. And, oh, you see the next plane hit and stuff like that. And you're all seeing this in real time. And in real time, the whole world mourned as the the first tower fell it collapsed on itself and we're like it's going to happen again we all knew we were moments away from the next tower can they get the mountain time and once again we all we all mourned as the second tower fell 1983 when i uh i had my first real job mm -hmm. that didn't involve lawnmowers uh, i worked uh for the firm drexel burnham lambert I was a runner on the Commodities Exchange in New York City, and that was in Tower 4. And for about a year, I would commute in from Mendham, New Jersey, take the PATH train underneath, get out the World Trade Center, walk across that plaza, go up to Tower 4 and do, do my clerk work. Mm -hmm. And so I was intimately familiar with all of those buildings and several uh, and in those days, clerks were hired out of college, and some would stay and go on and rise up through the ranks to be executives. Others would leave and do other things like I did. So I had a number of acquaintances who were killed that day from work 15, 20 years earlier, as well as people who I'd gone to school with in business school. Uh, and so there was a sense of, you know, I was far, far away in Florida at the time. And it was so it was unreal. It was like watching a horror movie. But then, yes, I I worked on that floor and because Tower Four came down when the mm -hmm. other two towers came down. They it wasn't struck, but when the other towers came down, they knocked down the other towers. Nobody was killed in Tower Four, thank goodness. But 
So there was a personal uh, sense to that. Um, but I don't really ever felt that, uh, I never really quite got why we had to get into Afghanistan. I can see given a bloody nose to Afghanistan, but I never quite understood why do we have to stay there mm -hmm. and turn them into a little Americans. It's one thing to give a short, sharp smack to make sure they get the lesson, don't do this again. Uh, but I never was, I was never a neoconservative thinking that we can rechange the world into our image as Americans. I'm a Christian, I want to change the world into Christ's image. And uh, I really never bought into sort of that neoconservative Bush worldview of foreign policy. But that's well, just I think me. it was probably more Cheney's worldview, Vice President Cheney, than Bush. But Bush was happy, to, not happy, it was dutifully to go along. It's interesting because all our lives, you and, and I, the Middle East has been a problem. Okay, for the last 8,000 years, the Middle East has been a problem uh, politically uh, because the warlords there like to fight wars and they don't need a lot of reason to fight a war and we've seen this between you know, certainly before 9-11 uh, we had the Iran-Iraq war we had Iraq invade Kuwait uh, we had the, the Iranian Iranian hostage crisis I mean it, my whole memory uh, all 56 years includes a Middle East that has been on the verge of war or at war. That's it, just that's Kevin's understanding of the Middle East that there is not a way to have peace there, and we know because Bill Clinton went into the Middle East, offered the greatest peace deal ever to the Hamas, and got Israel to agree to ninety nine point nine percent of what uh, the Hamas was asking for and the, the the PLO was asking for, and they wouldn't take the deal because it really, in the end, didn't want peace. This is a personal reflection, and this will annoy some people tremendously and anger others. When I first went to England uh, as a graduate student, in uh, Susan and I arrived in England the week Princess Diana died in the traffic accident, so that dates us uh, sure. when, we, when we were there. But as I got involved with English evangelicals and started writing for the Church of England newspaper and began to meet people and move in those world, I was struck by the anti-Semitism. Uh, not Nazi anti-Semitism, but just the general prejudice against Israel and against Jews that I did not see in the United States. So that, you know, I would meet people in these uh, GAFCON-related events who would publish, you know, these things uh, that were just, there's a, one of the untold stories of English evangelicalism is their toleration of anti-Semites within their ranks. Um, you know, oh, we're all on the same team. This guy has a particular hobby horse about Jews, but just so the casual remarks one would hear, because nobody's ever thought I was Jewish, and so they would felt, even though I was American, but they would feel safe to make these casual Jewish slanders. And again, it, perhaps it's culture. Maybe I ran with a bad crowd in England. I don't know. But uh, another thing to add to the whole Smythe and uh, Fletcher. John Fletcher controversy mm -hmm. is this is another thing they've got to clean up to. This, this uh, latent anti-Semitism that they don't do anything about within their ranks. Mm -hmm. There, I've pissed well, off half our audience, I'm sorry. Well, but, I mean, at, at a certain point, I think there's just a tolerance for it. There's a tolerance for the anti-Semitism because so much other good happens. You know, it's, and it's part of that culture. Certainly, there's a European culture that I've run into, not just in England, but in other European countries, of a, a very strong vein of anti-Semitism that I don't understand uh, as an American, as uh, the America who launched and fought into World War II that helped free uh, um, and capture uh, these these see, these furnaces, see, you know. I, just... I was warned about that strain of anti-Americanism mm -hmm. that these same people would have. And I mean, I was told in advance that there's a residual anger over the fact that Britain's no longer top dog America is, sure. and therefore there's a dislike of America and Americans in general 
they may like you because you're you or whatnot. But I was surprised to uh, see not only was this anti-Americanism uh, there, and maybe I didn't hear it because people were being polite to me, but I did hear the anti-Semitism. Sure. So. And, and here's the other thing that this was mentioned in our comments, but re England really is two nations in one country. Uh, and that the, the classes, you know, people would refer uh, to people of a different geographic, how should I put it? As a graduate student and as a chaplain, I was neither fish, fish, fish nor fowl. I was not a student, I was not staff, I, I was not a faculty. Mm -hmm. So where would they put me? Because I had a job, but I was also a student. So they housed me with the staff. So Susan and I had a little house next to the college butler, the college cook, the college porters, the sort of the people who made the schools run at, at, at my college at Oxford. And we got on perfectly fine with them. But hearing the worldview of the of the Dons and the experiences of the, the working class people who made the churches work, that made this colleges work, they really didn't exist. I mean, they really were not on the radar of of the people who counted. Uh, I don't want to be pejorative, but there was really a sense that these were foreigners in their own country. Yeah, probably. Um, we've talked many times about the caste, what I call an educational caste system. Um, and people in the comments, yes, you nailed it. That's it. That's what we got. You know, it's one of the problems they have in, uh, in Britain. George, we have gone on three minutes short of our average, which is fine. Uh, guys, please keep, you know, uh, peace in your prayers. Uh, can a 9-11 happen again? Absolutely. Why hasn't it happened yet? Who knows? Um, what should the future of uh, uh, American foreign policy be? I have no idea. I, that's above my pay grade. Can I go to God in prayer over this? Please. Please. Are you doing an altar call again? I'm Why Kevin not? Coulson. <laughs> and I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 685 of Anglican Unscripted.